Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Cooperation is something natural to uh, human beings as uh, social animals. At its most basic, cooperation can be defined as working with uh, other people uh, to accomplish things you can't accomplish for yourself. And from the moment that infants are born, they have to do exactly this to survive. Children need to uh, do so uh, as well to work both with parents and with their peers uh, in order to, to learn, to learn how to be sociable creatures and so on. If cooperation in that elemental way is something innate to us, it nonetheless develops like any other human experience and becomes more complex. And in the course of our own uh, uh, development, I thought I'd talk about two things today. What the first is what I know about and what I've researched uh, in terms of development, which are three aspects of practicing complex cooperation. And the second thing I'd like to talk to you about is why I think complex cooperation is a challenge in modern society. About the first of these, about the elements of skilled cooperation. I want to just lay out for you three pairs of, uh, of words that help us understand what uh, this kind of cooperation is. The first has to do with the difference between, I'm sorry for the jargon, dialogics and dialectics. The second has to do with the difference between declarative and subjunctive ways of talking to other people. And the third has to do with the difference between sympathy and empathy. These are skills that I've studied in uh, seeing how people become skilled listeners and how they s develop uh, uh, the ability to speak to other people in ways that encourage response and engagement. Let me start with dialogics and dialectics. I'm sure you all studied in school uh, one form of what dialectics is about, which is uh, a thesis, an antithesis, and a synthesis. You say X, I say not X, not at all, and we uh, duke it out, and we come to some conclusion, which is the synthesis, which is Y. It's not entirely how in um, dialectics works. Oftentimes, the interplay between people is not when you say X, I go, no, I totally disagree. But sometimes, you know, we change the subject or we start talking about something else. But nonetheless, there's the notion that we arrive at something which is a kind of consensus and that we have a feeling of catharsis. We're on the same page or we're talking to each other on a common ground. Dialogics is a different process. It's uh, more focused on listening skills where uh, you want to know what somebody means when they don't say it quite clearly. You try and intuit what they're really trying to say. You're not so much attuned to making uh, a response that challenges them as to unpacking what uh, they say. It's a kind of thing that happens, for instance, when people have casual conversations uh, in a bar, uh, and you meet somebody you don't know or uh, who you find perplexing, and your listening skill is to draw them out to say more about something that they can't verbalize very well. And the second important thing about dialogics is that it's a process that can go on even if you don't arrive at a consensus. That is the act of speaking back and forth, listening to e 
and hopefully listening to each other, trying to probe what's hidden in the ways people speak, doesn't need to come out with a feeling of common understanding. The second dimension of this skill has to do with the uh, issue of uh, declaration versus subjective presentation. If you were Americans, you would know this distinction immediately because most Americans declare. I think, you know, that raised finger, you know, I believe, and so on. Um, it's what the philosopher Bernard Williams calls the fetish of assertion. And uh, it's uh, a way of, um, of uh, aggressively confronting somebody else with something uh, which demands that uh, they uh, respond. A kind of more sub, what I call subjunctive way of presenting uh, an idea, I would have thought, it seems to me, and so on, is a way of opening up a space of ambiguity so that people can go back and forth. There's a third aspect to, um, to skilled cooperation in terms of communication, which has to do with the difference between sympathy and empathy. These are two ways of thinking about how you acknowledge and recognize other people. What makes sympathy work is identification. That is, I can imagine what you're like, the famous words of the American president, I feel your pain, and uh, you've identified, you imagine yourself as the other person, and so you reach out to them. Empathy gets more into the terrain of truly skilled cooperation. It occurs when uh, you can't make that leap of identification, uh, where you understand that somebody else is upset about something which you yourself can understand. Um, if you're a Christian confronted with somebody who is upset about some uh, aspect of Islamic Sharia law or some uh, cultural practice, you don't presume to say, oh, I get what's, what's bugging you but you understand that the other is uh, experiencing something uh, that requires your attention without uh, presuming that you have the understanding to fully comprehend. And this is what is technically known as empathic communication. That is sending signals to another person that you're attending to what they're doing, recognizing what they're doing without saying, um, God, poor you, I can imagine that must be terrible for you. The reason it's a skill is that it doesn't have the same kind of psychological foundation. My colleague Sarah Hurdy calls it a skill that's animated more by curiosity than by compassion. And her notion is that basically what moves people when they develop this empathy skill is that they know how to uh, show curiosity about what somebody else is doing to that other person in order to stimulate further interaction. And her argument is that empathy is really associated with, in, in a sense, a kind of interest, almost dispassionate interest, in what's going on outside you rather than a kind of a highly charged emotion of identification as occurs in sympathy. In the work world, the thing that, in my view, really inhibits people from becoming skilled at cooperation is the short-term time frames around modern work. The fact that people are, even in when modern business pays lip service to, to teamwork as a form of cooperation, the teams are together for short periods of time, usually six to eight months, focused on a single task. Uh, people work in jobs uh, for much shorter periods than, than they have a, a couple of generations ago. And most of all, very dynamic modern corporations uh, tend to compose and recompose themselves uh, in fairly rapid order. What this means 
is that one aspect of developing these formal skills, uh, uh, these skills, doesn't appear. And that is that people have the time uh, to spend with other people uh, to develop something that's dialogical, uh, that's subjunctive, and that's empathetic. These all take time. They're not quick, instant skills. These are skills that you cannot write down in an organizational chart or handbook. They're informal skills. They come out of uh, people uh, working with each other, finding small clues about uh, ways to, uh, to interact with others. There's no recipe that tells you how to, how to be tomorrow dialogical, empathic, uh, and uh, speak subjunctively. It's something that requires experience. And increasingly in the modern work world, we simply don't allow that informality to appear. If you keep re-engineering and reforming a work unit, whether it's the National Health Service or Google, which is now going through a, a trauma about lowered cooperation, the result is that cooperation of this informal complex sort diminishes with a tangible result that productivity goes down. What we're seeing in the development of modern cities is increasing homogenization of urban space so that in the territories where people live and where they work, where the schools are and so on, that differences are uh, neutralized, that each small territory keeps to itself there are very few occasions for people of different races or different classes to have to deal with each other informally. What you've got is a society that looks like, because of the complex amounts of social groups it contains, that it should be a natural laboratory for learning the skills of complex cooperation. But in fact, because people are so segregated from each other, those skills don't develop. I am concerned, or I'm focused, on what it means for human beings to become skilled, in this case to become socially skilled, and I'm worried uh, that the conditions of uh, the modern workplace and the modern city, which are complicated, are not energizing, are not sparking the kinds of social relationships that would allow people to become more socially competent in dealing with complex human situations. In terms of developing these three skills, right. I'm just interested in the balance that you would attribute, and I think as a sociologist, I kind of know where you're going to come, where you're going to answer this. To what extent is it personality? To what extent is it social milieu, social norms? And to what extent is it something which has to be cultivated by, you know, by practice, by, by kind of conscious effort? I'm interested in, in what is the makeup of somebody who is ready for togetherness? The more the, the social institutions organize things, that the more skilled you'll become at that. If I just extrapolate from this for a bit, I mean, society can train people to be better at uh, managing cooperation, even in very uh, competitive or adversary circumstances. If any of you have served in the military, you know exactly what I mean about, about this. Cowboy warriors bent on becoming heroes are people who are likely to bring uh, platoons uh, to ruin. Uh, in the military, we constantly have to find ways for people who are engaged in the most kind of aggressive behavior to be very attentive to and cooperative with other people, uh, tolerant of their weaknesses, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, it's a matter of social organization. Implicit here is that we were better at being together in the past, but of course, human beings are 190,000 years old as a species, and for 99.9% .9 of that, we only ever mixed with people like ourselves, really. And we have now suddenly got to cope with this world where we are dealing with people who are very different from ourselves. Right. And some of your references in the book, even, when you talk about Boston in the 1970s, yeah. whatever, this would be to a more homogenous time. Now, is it not arguably simply the case that it is diversity, it is globalization, 
that is driving some of the things that worry you and that maybe, you know, human beings are just not very good at this stuff. As a writer, I'm certainly not nostalgic for the, the past, whatever that is, as a kind of default position. I do f uh, very strongly believe that in the last 30 years that the forms of that capitalism have taken are more um, uh, challenging and more potentially destructive than the kind of social capitalism which existed in this country after the war and which still exists in Germany and so on. I mean, I think we are, for, as a sociologist, I would say that what's happening to our experience of work is becoming degraded. I'm not, we couldn't bring back that earlier era. But take it out of the workplace, Richard, put it yeah. into the community. You know, perhaps human it's beings have to try harder than you imagine that they have to get on other people. Maybe only a small number of people are ever going to be able to cope. I don't think that's so. I mean, if but you... We will retreat. If you look, you know, it's an interesting thing. If you look at the history of uh, places like Smyrna, um, Lebanon, uh, Beirut in Lebanon, you're looking at really quite complex communities in which daily life, people are exposed to people far different than themselves, either by religion or race, and got along uh, reasonably well. They're fragile communities. There's, there's nothing long-term uh, ordained about, about complex cooperation. I think the problem for us today is that we have what one of the social trends in modern cities is that they're becoming more homogeneous at the local level by class, race, and, and religion that the edges between communities are much deader than they've been in, uh, as, than they were in the 19th century. If we have the physical conditions uh, which allow us, for instance, if you live in a gated community, you're not going to learn very much about dealing with uh, people who are different than you. And if you're sold the notion that you should be living in a gated community, which most people are, that that's the safest place you can be, uh, you're going to become socially impaired. Recently, both in the work world and the communal world, we're seeing a society that is, uh, is more segregated, isolated, and uh, non-interactive. And I think that's something we can do something about. Our, our forebearers did something about it. We're, we're not any more psychologically damaged uh, uh, or, or biologically damaged than they are, we could do something about it as well.